Hello, I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of what happened to Harpers Ferry. We'll start this with an examination of the sites surrounding Harpers Ferry in the Fallout universe and in the real world. We'll then move into the layout of the town in the Fallout universe and how it compares to the layout of the town in the real world. We'll examine the history of Harpers Ferry in the Fallout universe and a brief history of Harpers Ferry in the real world. Lastly, I have a couple of comments about this content. Let's get started. In the Fallout universe, Harper's Ferry is located in the central part of the region of Appalachia known as the Mire. Up the hills west of Harper's Ferry lies the Sunday Brothers Cabin, a former home of Free State's members Jesus and Juan Diego Sunday. Northwest of Harper's Ferry, the power of the Thunder Mountain power plant can be drawn from substation TM-01. Further up the hills to the northwest lies Berkeley Springs and its train station. North of Harper's Ferry, the Southern Bell Motel sits on the side of Highway 65. Northeast of Harpers Ferry, Senator Sam Blackwell hid his bunker in a fake abandoned waste stump. East northeast of Harpers Ferry lies the decrepit remains of a farm known as Delano Grange. A bit further in that direction, Tanagra Town has been lifted into the sky by the red strangler vines that have infested the mire since 2078. East of Harpers Ferry, the Harpers Ferry Tunnel didn't just serve as a train tunnel, but also as the secret access point to a large Baishi Company natural gas pipeline. That pipeline, now empty of gas, serves as a highway to the Blue Ridge Caravan Company. Further east of the tunnel, the ransacked bunker of Jeremiah has become the home of a group of former American soldiers. South of Harpers Ferry sits Big B's Rest Stop, consisting of a Super Duper Mart and Red Rocket gas station. Further south, Treetops, a series of treehouses, rises high over the mire. South-southwest of Harpers Ferry, the cultist-site Moth Home sits on a hill above the surrounding mire. In the Fallout universe, as in the real world, Harpers Ferry lies at the junction of the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers. Both cities have two rail lines passing through them, but while the in-game southwestern-oriented line ends in a collapsed tunnel, the real version ends at Millville Quarry. And while the in-game northwestern line ends at Berkeley Springs, the real version runs well past Berkeley Springs as it's the original B&O rail line from Baltimore to Ohio. In fact, if this were taken into account in-game, we'd be able to follow this line to Grafton, Clarksburg, and beyond. Back to Harpers Ferry though. Harpers Ferry is the second best recreation of a town in Fallout 76 after Helvetia. The difference between the real and in-game versions lies primarily in scope, as the in-game version primarily consists of the part of Harpers Ferry called Lower Town, while the more modern upper part of Harpers Ferry is absent. Both in-game and in the real world, Harpers Ferry has Shenandoah Street, Potomac Street, and Church Street. The in-game roads partially correspond to the real versions, Although, because the town consists only of the lower portion, there is no need for streets like High Street, the real-world road that climbs to the upper portion of the town. It should be noted, however, that at the top, High Street becomes Washington Street, which can also be found in-game. In-game, Harpers Ferry has a church that strongly resembles St. Peter's Catholic Church, the clinic resembles the Black Voices Museum, and the structure known as John Brown's Fort is found in both versions. Truly, because of how well recreated parts of Lower Town Harpers Ferry are, I recommend that you take a look at all of it in Google Maps. In the real world, Harpers Ferry is considered to be a midpoint of the Appalachian Trail, the hiking route that runs from Springer Mountain, Georgia, to Mount Katahdin, Maine. In fact, because of their position in the town, in-game, I believe that these stairs are the equivalent of the Appalachian Trail stairs. As for local municipalities, as I mentioned before, Berkeley Springs lies just up the hill to the west in game, while in the real world, Berkeley Springs lies approximately 33 miles to the northwest. While not local in game, it should be noted that real Harpers Ferry lies approximately 49 miles northwest of Washington, D.C., the heart of the capital wasteland in the Fallout universe. Along with this, Raven Rock, a site that was found in Fallout 3, is actually further from DC than Harpers Ferry, at approximately 62 miles north-northwest of Washington. This means that Harpers Ferry is actually closer to DC than sites found in the Capital Wasteland in Fallout 3. I'm hoping that this means that we're going to get some glimpse of the early days of the Capital Wasteland at some point in the future of Fallout 76. That said, let's look at the composition of Harpers Ferry in-game. In the Fallout universe, Harpers Ferry is home to houses, Apartments, office buildings, a pub, five cafes, three other restaurants, five bookstores, a pawn shop, a pharmacy, a clinic, a museum, a polling station, a bus stop, a church, John Brown's Fort, 
The Reconstructed Armory, Jefferson's Rock, and 15 air scrubbers. There are also three structures with signs that say registration. Well, one of these appears likely to be a train station. I'm not sure what in particular one would register for in the other two locations. With the setting established, let's get into the history of Harpers Ferry in the Fallout universe. Before the war, Harpers Ferry was a tourist town, drawing in visitors interested in the town's natural beauty and its historic significance. In order to capitalize on the town's history, John Brown's Fort, a relic of the original Harpers Ferry arsenal, a reconstruction of some of the arsenal and armory buildings, and a museum all lay within close proximity of the point. Likely having been just as flood prone as the real world Harpers Ferry, a massive storm sewer system was installed beneath the town. In the years between the floods, these sewers served as the home for a small homeless population. A lack of funds for repairs meant that the condition of the tunnels was generally getting worse and worse. This began to change in September of 2072, when the deteriorating state of the tunnel system got bad enough that funds were approved for renovations. Unfortunately for the locals, these funds were largely devoted to upgrading an enormous high-tech pumping station, complete with security turrets and robots. I, I say unfortunately because this station was intended to pump water from Harpers Ferry to the White Spring Resort, and while this goal was achieved, the aging storm sewer system was left in its increasingly decrepit state. Public Works employees who had been working these tunnels for years were now told to evict anyone attempting to live in the tunnel system. They didn't enjoy this task, they knew these people needed help. While they were bound by the rules to call the police, they gave them fair warning to leave before doing so. By the end of winter 2075, the work on the pumping station was complete, and the Public Works employees began facing layoffs. It turned out that, along with the security robots, the day-to-day -day maintenance would be taken over by an automated workforce as well. One data analyst who had been working in the pumping station for 18 years decided that he wasn't going to take this job loss lying down. He reprogrammed the security turrets to fire indiscriminately should they ever be turned on. A quote, little parting gift, end quote. In the town above these tunnels, there was another bit of automation taking place, but it was a welcome change for the Harpers Ferry Clinic. In September of 2076, a medtech technician began to install a medtech symptomatic. Though this state-of-the-art chamber was capable of diagnosing and treating illness and even prescribing medication to the user, the technician initially billed it effectively as an automated thermometer, sphygmomanometer, and phlebotomist. He didn't want to risk a doctor taking a torch to what might well be their replacement. The clinic's doctor got used to this device, though, and they began to appreciate it as though it were just another doctor on staff. It meant that they didn't have to be on call 24-7. After a few initial hiccups, including an accidental arm removal, the symptomatic was a complete success. While the clinic was now well suited to treat all manner of conditions, the staff would soon be refusing to serve some of the locals. These people, specifically the Carson family of neighboring Berkeley Springs, were members of the Free States movement. I'll fully explore the Free States organization in an upcoming lore video. Until then, I'll give you this basic overview. The Free States was a loosely linked group of families that lived primarily in the Shenandoah Valley. These families believed that the federal government and the military-industrial complex that it was a part of were going to end up escalating the existing war with China into a nuclear exchange. They viewed vault as just another part of this military-industrial complex, and thus they decided they would have to build their own shelters. As of November 2076, they were purchasing supplies from businesses in Harpers Ferry to fill their brand new reinforced concrete bunkers across the region. While Free State's members wanted to protect their families, they weren't exclusively interested in saving themselves, and thus they were prone to prepper evangelism. Their views about the war and the government were not taken well by patriotic locals, and arguments broke out. These arguments turned to fights, and soon Harpers Ferry was in a constant state of political upheaval. The ideals of the Free States didn't go unnoticed by the local domestic spy base at Sugar Grove, and by March 2077, government agents were in Harpers Ferry investigating concerns of seditious behavior. Anti-Free States propaganda posters went up, hostilities continued to rise. With news of the trouble at home and abroad, the summer tourism season of 2077 was a complete disaster, and businesses in Harpers Ferry were struggling financially. Late in the summer, Free States members declared the secession from the United States and went underground. The people of Harpers Ferry sighed a sigh of relief at the peace that descended upon the town. Unfortunately, the members of the Free States were right. On the morning of October 23rd, 2077, the war with China ended in waves of nuclear fire radiating out from hundreds if not thousands of craters. In the aftermath of the bombs, the federal government collapsed practically immediately, with many high-level officials letting it happen purposefully. 
Certain units of the military held on for a few months, but without a chain of command and resupply, it was only a matter of time before they were dispersed into the post-apocalyptic wasteland. In Harpers Ferry, Mayor Miranda Vox was left to hold the town together as best she could. There was little that could be done in those early days but to survive. While Harpers Ferry was spared a direct hit on the day of the bombs, and even potentially direct fallout, it seems likely that they would have been impacted by it secondarily. The watershed for the Potomac and Shenandoah rivers covers 9,180 square miles. The fallout from any bomb could have fallen into this watershed and been washed downstream. Conditions for those who survived outside of a fallout shelter were dire. In the tunnels beneath Harpers Ferry where once a handful of homeless might have found shelter, a society formed, separate from the one that was eking out a living above. Refugees found their way in and built shelters for themselves. They survived in the tunnel's rats for a time. Eventually the society organized to a point where a leader named Maud rose to the ranks. These dwellers of the burrows, as they called them, formed their society on the ideals of peace and community. They had neighborhoods, a mess hall, a market, and a clinic run by drug dealer slash doctor Kin. A group rose from among the dwellers of the burrows to take on security and scavenging. Known as the Burrow Boys, these fighters organized under Marcus, the son of a former public works employee. While this arrangement worked for a time, it wasn't too long before the men with weapons decided that they wanted power in the community. They seized that power in a coup. While the Burrows had used robots and turrets left over from before the bombs as part of their security, the Burrow Boys hacked these tools, converting them to their control, solidifying their hold on the tunnels. Not wanting to live under the iron fist of Marcus, but unable to fight his forces, many felt that it was time to leave the burrows. While the burrow boys held most of the tunnels, some of the people of the burrows found their way out, and these second-time refugees founded the community of Moss Town to the northwest. Unfortunately, Maud, their leader, did not manage to get out. She decided to steal tribute back from the burrow boys and was killed by Marcus in the process. As for the Burrow Boys themselves, I can't say exactly what happened to them, but I will note that the tunnels are filled with dozens of feral ghouls to this day. In late October 2078, a strange sight greeted the people of Harpers Ferry, a woman in a blue and yellow jumpsuit. It was a missionary from Vault 94. She explained that Vault 94 was a peaceful community devoted to faith, nonviolence, and living in harmony with nature. The vault had plenty of food and supplies, and she was there to invite them back for a welcome day celebration. Mayor Vox was hopeful about this, but she was too busy to look into it herself, thus she sent a small group to investigate. These four, Cole, Billy, Red, and Lucas, set out to meet with the dwellers. Unfortunately, they believed that the vault was a trap. They even killed the ambassador before heading to the vault, armed with a minigun. I cover the full events of this interaction in my video covering Vault 94, but I think it suffices to say that this did not go well. Blundering by the Harbors Ferry delegation in Vault 94 ended up causing a reactor meltdown that sent a wave of radiation through the region. This radiation was responsible for creating some of the bizarre wildlife that occupies the mire. Without the help of Vault 94, the people of Harbors Ferry would have to continue suffering for the time being. In the summer of 2079, Mayor Vox's scouts discovered that the Free States had begun to emerge from their bunkers. Before the bombs, Mayor Vox had hated the Free States movement, and had even told one of their leaders, Raleigh Clay, to shove his movement where the sun don't shine and get the hell out of her town. Now, she knew they might be the only ones who could help. She ventured out to Mr. Clay's bunker, apologized, and pleaded for his assistance. He agreed to visit Harpers Ferry with his daughter Martha. When he saw the living conditions in his hometown, he knew he needed to help. The Clays returned to their bunker, and Raleigh began to plan. He called the other bunkers on the radio and got them on board with the rebuilding effort. Soon the Clay and Singh families, the Sunday brothers, Ella Ames and Eddie Hayes arrived to help. The first thing they focused on? Security. Barriers were erected to seal off the town's streets. Along the old B&O rail line, a train formed their northeastern wall. Walls went up around the church on the hill. Patrols, formal guard posts, and watchmen were put in place. The Free States secured the reconstructed Harpers Ferry Armory for their own local headquarters. With security in hand, Neeraj Singh was freed up to work on a new project, the Air Scrubber. In the aftermath of the bombs, Harpers Ferry was occasionally struck by rad storms, with radioactive material being brought in by the wind. In order to protect the people of Harpers Ferry, Neeraj Singh created the Air Scrubber, a device intended to filter the open air of the town. While we don't know exactly how effective this tool was, we do know that it evidently worked well enough to justify the construction of 15 of them in and around town in a time when the materials to build them would not have been easy to come by. The Free States also established commerce in Harbors Ferry, trading with neighboring settlements like Moss Town and programming a protectron to serve as a vendor in the market. 
The first contact Harpers Ferry would have with another group of friendly survivors would come in mid-spring 2080 with the arrival of the responders. With contact made, a new trade route was established between Harpers Ferry and the responders' headquarters in Charleston. In the town's old clinic, Free Stater Ella Ames re-established medical care with the help of the responders. She was joined in this effort by Lucy Harwick, Martha Clay, and Abby Singh. Even Miranda Vox chipped in in the clinic, having surrendered leadership to the Free States. While the members of the Free States were still a separate entity from the average citizens of Harbors Ferry, they began to form a community together. With the world outside changing thanks to the radiation of the bombs and the meltdown of Vault 94, the people of Harpers Ferry began to see more and more ghouls under the area. In these days, little was known about the ghouls. Because of their grotesque appearance and the fear that whatever condition may have caused their current state might be transmissible, they were viewed as yet another monster of the wasteland that the guards would shoot on sight. Ella Ames and Maria Chavez, one of the responders, were conducting autopsies on the stacks of ghoul corpses to try to understand the strange biology of these unfortunate creatures. Amidst the killing, a rumor began to bubble up. Well, most ghouls would utter a guttural scream and charge at the wastelanders, some were said to have spoken before they were shot. This rumor of sentient ghouls was generally dismissed by most until one of the citizens of Harbors Ferry became one. Daniel Whitby, formerly of Berkeley Springs, had made a life in Harbors Ferry after the bombs. When he came down with an unknown illness, he went on bed rest, assisted by Lucy Harwick of the Harbors Ferry Clinic. As time went by and Daniel's absence began to drag on, others went to check on him. They discovered the terrifying truth. Daniel's skin had sloughed off and his hair had fallen out. Though he was still fully conscious and mentally himself, he was a ghoul. Lucy, formerly an esthetician, had been hiding his condition while attempting fruitlessly to cure it. This explosive revelation threw the town into chaos. Lucy was forced to flee Harbors Ferry, and Daniel was placed in quarantine while the town figured out what to do with him. While some feared that his condition was communicable, others viewed it as simply a result of the environment they were living in, but regardless, most wanted him out of town. While we do now know that ghoulification is not a transmissible illness, it's easy to understand how in those early days they would have viewed Daniel as a potential Stuff health threat. Here. We don't know exactly what happened to Daniel, but we do know that the ghouls of Appalachia segregated themselves in order to avoid persecution. Wait. Many migrated to the Valley Galleria Mall, where they joined a community founded by Lucy Harwick who coincidentally became a ghoul herself. Unfortunately, they wouldn't be safe even there, but we'll get to that soon enough. In 2081, the people of Harpers Ferry met another generally friendly group of survivors, the Brotherhood of Steel. Headed by former Army Ranger Lieutenant Elizabeth Taggarty, this group was the local incarnation of an organization founded on the West Coast by former Army Captain Roger Maxson. Dedicated to protecting humanity and preserving technology, this group was making their own attempt to secure the region around Harpers Ferry as they trained new members at their outpost, Camp Venture. The Free States were not big fans of the Brotherhood, as the Proto-Brotherhood... Taggarty's Thunder, had laid siege to, and then seized, the Thunder Mountain power plant, the site that the Free States had themselves secured back in 2079. Beyond this, Camp Venture was formerly a Free States training site, though they don't seem to have been as bothered by the Brotherhood's seizure of this property. As the Brotherhood didn't have the time or inclination to make or scavenge their own food and ammunition, they requested these supplies from the locals. In return for these goods, the Brotherhood secured the roads and provided a safe route for trade caravans to cross the mountains between Charleston and Harpers Ferry. Unfortunately, on the morning of Christmas Day 2082, raiders blew up the Lake Summersville Dam, drowning or washing away hundreds of survivors that were living in Charleston. The responders were nearly lost with this flood. Cross Mountain trade likely slowed to a crawl while they regrouped in Morgantown. Despite this, the trade routes over the mountains were maintained, and the Brotherhood even secured a new outpost at Grafton Dam. Unbeknownst to the people of Harpers Ferry, like the people of Charleston, their end was coming. The military-industrial complex that the Free States had reviled before the war had in fact been an actual organization known as the Enclave. The Enclave had survived the war and, among other places, the bunker beneath the White Spring Resort. Far to the south of Harpers Ferry, in an Enclave laboratory hidden in an old mine deep in the Cranberry Bog, an accident had created a monster, an enormous bat. These organisms that would become known as the Scorch Beasts corrupted the ground and living organisms around them. Rather than exterminate this monster as they desired, the Enclave scientists who had created it were ordered to make more. While the creatures were generally confined to the mine for a time, it wasn't long before they managed to find ways outside. Former Senator Sam Blackwell and his daughter Judith had both been chased by Scorch Beasts on two separate occasions. Down at the Allegheny Asylum, advanced scouts of the Brotherhood of Steel had seen one flying over the bog. The threat was growing. 
In early 2084, a disease passed through the mire, killing some of the wastelanders of Harbors Ferry, along with Senator Blackwell's daughter Judith. Blackwell was fairly certain that he'd seen something about this disease in documents he'd read about Department of Agriculture programs before the war, but with his worsening dementia, he couldn't be sure. The survivors in the area buried their dead and continued to soldier on through the post-apocalypse. Some losses, though, weren't taken in stride. When Harpers Ferry citizen Duncan McCann's wife and children were killed by feral ghouls, he organized a ghoul hunting party and struck out across the mire. If you're interested in the full story of the resulting dire chemical massacre, I suggest that you check out my video covering that topic specifically. For our purposes, it suffices to say that Duncan McCann's hunting party did not return. With the losses that stemmed from disease and the missing hunting party, the guards on the walls of Harper's Ferry were stretched fairly thin. Left alone in his bunker after his daughter's death, Sam Blackwell decided to head out to Harper's Ferry to rejoin his old friends. When the former senator realized that he'd been recognized by an enclave agent in town, he followed the agent into an alley and murdered him. He was too late. The agent had already gotten word back to the White Spring, and a manhunt was being organized for Sam Blackwell. Wanting to obscure what had happened, Blackwell butchered the slain agent and fled town. When the people of Harpers Ferry found the body, they feared that there was a maniac on the loose or that there was some new monster in the mire. The Free State's members feared that this body could have been Blackwell's. While Blackwell was the first Free Stater to return to his bunker, it wouldn't be long before the rest did the same. In June of 2086, as the rebuilt responders and the Brotherhood of Steel celebrated their victory over the super mutants of Huntersville, they couldn't have known how their actions would affect the people of Harpers Ferry. The Super Mutants had been released purposefully by the Enclave in order to facilitate the use of the local automated nuclear missile silos. The silos worked on an automated DEFCON system that registered that the local conditions were not dire enough to warrant a nuclear war, and thus the silos were, for the moment, inoperable. The Enclave had hoped that the Super Mutants would trigger the required DEFCON 1 rating, but it wasn't enough. With the defeat of the Super Mutants, Enclave President Thomas Eckhart ordered the release of the monstrous Scorch Beasts. Though a coup began in the White Spring Bunker to prevent this order from being carried out, it was too late. The Scorched Beasts appeared in the sky over Harper's Ferry and used their powerful echolocation to batter the citizens of the town. They swooped down, spreading their corruption to the people, infecting them with a deadly plague. When the plague's effects on the infected specimen was complete, they joined the Scorched Beasts in attacking their old fellows. Completely unprepared for this aerial and biological attack, Harper's Ferry was destroyed with the short attack ruining seven years of hard work. The Free Staters that survived fled to their bunkers, and the few survivors of the citizens of Harper's Ferry fled to refuges nearby. They knew that there was no purpose in attempting to reclaim the town. There was nothing to keep this from happening again. When the responders attempted to investigate the attack, they heard the reports of the monsters and the plague, but they didn't really understand the nature of the threat. They believed that the Free Staters were being selfish by retreating to their bunkers. Nine years later, the Brotherhood of Steel fell to the Scorch Beasts and the Responders a year after that. As for the people that fled the burrows from Moss Town years before, it seems that they were spared for a time likely due to the tree cover. Despite this though, these survivors made a massive mistake. It appears that the people of Moss Town scavenged a sonic attractor built by the Brotherhood of Steel. These devices were specifically built to draw in the Scorch Beasts. They installed the attractor in town. Upon activating it, Moss Town likely suffered the same fate as Harpers Ferry. The vendor bot in Harpers Ferry managed to survive not only the scorched attack, but the subsequent 16 years before the arrival of the dwellers of Vault 76. It recently relocated to the Berkeley Springs train station. Alright, that's about all that I could find on the in-game history of Harpers Ferry, so let's get into the real world history. The source for much of this information is government websites, largely the National Park Service, which makes sense when you consider that almost all of the original Harpers Ferry is a national park. Let's start with the geological history. The spot that would one day become host to Harpers Ferry lies at the confluence of the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers at the foot of the Blue Ridge mountain range, a part of the overall Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachians are an old mountain range, having begun their formation approximately 480 million years ago. Over the next approximately 414 million years, the Appalachians were built up and eroded, to the point where they were nearly flat by the end of the Mesozoic era 66 million years ago. Through the next 66 million years, the Appalachians have been uplifted to become the shape they are today. This has caused the sometimes bizarre appearance of the underlying rock as they've been lifted up and folded. As part of that geological action, rivers began to cut through the tough volcanic bedrock. Approximately 5 million years ago, the Potomac cut its way through the tough rock of the Blue Ridge Mountains, creating the gap in the mountains we see today. 
The remains of these sections of mountain ridge that have been erased by the river are still strongly apparent in the linear formation of rock that crossed the river on its way to the Chesapeake Bay. The native history of the area dates back approximately 18,000 years towards the end of an ice age. While glaciers had never reached Virginia, the area is thought to have been about 18 to 27 degrees cooler on average, with far less rainfall in that time. Too cold for deciduous trees, the Shenandoah River Valley was composed of grasslands and conifer forests. The newly arrived Paleo Indians were hunter-gatherers that roamed the area hunting the local fauna. While they brought the dog with them from Asia, they didn't have any use for other domesticated animals. Though they are not thought to have established any permanent settlements in the area in that time, there is a belief that they may have established camps on sources of valuable stone, if only for a time. While in my other videos in West Virginia, I've discussed the Adena peoples and their mound building during the woodland period, I don't think that they made it as far east as Harbors Ferry. While there were groups of natives in the Shenandoah River Valley that practiced mound building in their funerary rites, I couldn't find any evidence that this was done near Harper's Ferry. The unfortunate thing about studying the native history of this time period in this part of the world is that they didn't write things down, and they used materials that were largely compostable, so much of their heritage has been lost to time. The first named tribe that I could find that lived in the area were the Huron, who occupied the region in the late 15th and early 16th centuries before they were driven off by the Iroquois Confederacy who wanted the land as part of their seasonal hunting grounds. During the early 1700s, the area was occupied by part of the Tuscarora tribe. The Tuscarora had fought a war with the colonies of North and South Carolina in which they were defeated. Many migrated north to what is now New York to become the sixth nation of the Iroquois Confederacy, but some settled near what is now Martinsburg, West Virginia. While these Tuscarora eventually migrated north, there are places near Martinsburg that still bear their name. That pretty much covers the native history of the area, so let's backtrack slightly to cover the start of the colonial period. In 1649, the Northern Neck Proprietary was created by exiled English King Charles II. This grant, which encompassed all the land between the Potomac and Rappahannock Rivers, approximately 5 million acres, was granted to seven Englishmen. While few recognized this claim at the time, the land was unexplored and the king was without a kingdom, by 1660 Charles was restored to the throne and the land grant was legal. Control of the Northern Neck Proprietary was eventually vested in one man. Thomas Culpepper, 2nd Baron Culpepper, son of one of the original grantees. When he died, the land passed to his daughter and her husband, Thomas Fairfax, 5th Lord Fairfax of Cameron. With his death, the land passed to the 6th Lord Fairfax of Cameron, who in 1735 migrated to Virginia to become the first of the land's owners to actually see the land he owned. Lord Fairfax had the land surveyed in 1736. He returned to England to secure the legality of his holdings, before returning to Virginia in 1747. In this same year, Robert Harper, a Pennsylvanian builder, was hired by the Quakers to build a meeting house on the Shenandoah River near present-day Winchester, Virginia. On his way to perform this task, Harper passed through the area at the confluence of the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers. As he was also a millwright, Harper recognized the immense potential of the area's water power. There was a squatter by the name of Peter Stevens who had been living on this land since 1733. Harper paid Stevens 30 guineas for his squatter's rights. In 1748, one year after Harper acquired the land from Stevens and the cabin Stevens had built on it, the cabin was destroyed in a flood. This flood was the first recorded of many that would hit the area, as the lower part of modern Harpers Ferry lies in the floodplain for both the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers. In 1751, Harper made his holdings more legal by purchasing the area from the rightful holder, Lord Fairfax. 1753 brought with it the pumpkin flood, as pumpkins grown in local native villages were washed down the river past Mr. Harper's property. Information on the natives responsible for these flood pumpkins is not easy to come by as the natives and the colonists seem to have avoided each other in this area at this time. Though a ferry had been operating at the site prior to Mr. Harper's arrival, in 1761 the Virginia General Assembly granted Harper the right to establish a ferry there. And in 1763 they created the town of Shenandoah Falls at Mr. Harper's Ferry in Frederick County, Virginia. In 1772, Berkeley County was split off from Frederick County, taking Harper's Ferry with it. On October 25, 1783, Thomas Jefferson visited Harper's Ferry while traveling up to Philadelphia. He viewed the passage of the Potomac through the Blue Ridge Mountains and stated that the view was, quote, worth a voyage across the Atlantic, unquote. The rock he stood on while making this observation was later named in his honor. Jefferson Rock can also be found in the Follett universe, as well as the four pillars that were added in the late 1850s to stabilize it. In 1785, George Washington, a longtime proponent of making the Potomac navigable, became the president of the newly formed Potomac Company. 
The goal of the company was to create a series of canals along the Potomac and other rivers with the goal of creating a water route to the Ohio Territory. The time Washington spent traveling this area gave him a great understanding of the sheer quantity of water power available at Harbors Ferry. Around Harbors Ferry, the Potomac dropped 22 feet in a mile, the Shenandoah 14 feet. The point of Harpers Ferry commanded a drainage of 9,180 square miles of Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. 8,260 cubic feet of water passed by every second. That's 61,789 gallons per second, capable of generating 18,350 horsepower. While one might not see Harpers Ferry today as a site of industry, in the 18th and 19th centuries, water power drove the mills. When the United States Congress voted in 1794 to create federal arsenals, the now President Washington knew just where to place one. In 1796, the federal government purchased 125 acres from the descendants of Robert Harper, and by 1799, the Harpers Ferry Armory was under construction. This would make Harpers Ferry home of the second national armory after the Springfield Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts was established and constructed via the same act of Congress. Crazy as it might seem today, when defense contractors make all of our weapons, the United States government used to manufacture the arms for the military. The Harpers Ferry Armory was also important in the introduction of replaceable parts to gun manufacturing. Before this, artisans would make one gun at a time, and if a part broke, a gunsmith would have to make a new custom part for that specific gun. That all changed with replaceable parts. Rather than manufacturing the part for the gun, Harpers Ferry manufactured the parts to specification, leading to the development of machining techniques at the Harpers Ferry Armory. On October 26, 1801, the portion of Berkeley County in which Harpers Ferry resides was split off to form Jefferson County. In my video on Beckley, West Virginia, I mentioned that Beckley's County, Raleigh County, had once been part of Fayette County, Virginia. That was, in fact, the second Fayette County, Virginia, as the first one was lost to the formation of Kentucky. Just as with Fayette County, Jefferson County was the second Jefferson County, Virginia, with the first one lost to the formation of Kentucky. And, of course, the new Fayette and Jefferson counties were lost to West Virginia during the Civil War. I just thought this was an interesting little tidbit. Anyway, the Harpers Ferry Armory opened in 1802 and began mass producing arms. Unfortunately, the structure built on the site was too small for the job and seems to have been mismanaged. The armory wasn't the only industry to take advantage of the power offered by the rivers, and in the early 19th century, many mills were built on Virginia's island. These included a sawmill, flour mill, machine shop, cotton mills, a tannery, and an iron forge. In 1828, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal began construction, attempting to continue with the Potomac Company began decades earlier, creating a water route to Ohio. Canals were dug, aqueducts built, a tunnel drilled, locks constructed, towpaths cleared, to eventually create a 184.5 mile long canal from Washington, D.C. to Cumberland, Maryland. In 1834, the Potomac and Winchester Railroad reached nearby Sandy Hook, Maryland. In 1836, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad completed a bridge spanning the river, and the Potomac and Winchester tied their line into the B&O line crossing the bridge. This created the first intersection of two rail lines in the United States. In 1844, plans were drawn up to fix the over four decade old issues with the Harpers Ferry Armory. Many new structures were built, more efficient turbines were installed, the Armory Canal was enlarged, 121 new machines were added, and the workforce increased from 25 to 400. In 1850, the CNO Canal reached its greatest length when it hit Cumberland, Maryland. It would never be completed as, unfortunately for the canal, railroads were taking over transportation of goods and people. Another great flood hit Harpers Ferry in 1852, damaging dams and mills along the river. Likely the most momentous event in the history of Harpers Ferry occurred on the evening of October 16, 1859. Ardent abolitionist John Brown and his 21-man Army of Liberation struck Harpers Ferry. John Brown had spent the past few years fighting pro-slavery forces in Kansas, participating in the Potawatomi Massacre in which Brown and a group of sword-wielding abolitionists killed five slave hunters and pro-slavery militants. When he brought his army to Harpers Ferry, John Brown was planning to seize the 100,000 weapons in the arsenal and begin a guerrilla war in the Blue Ridge Mountains, arming runaway slaves to fight their masters. Instead, the raid would be over in 36 hours. Though he cut the telegraph wires, Brown allowed a train to pass through and bring news of the raid to the state and federal governments. Locals besieged the armory, keeping the raiders pinned down inside. On the morning of October 18th, a company of United States Marines under Colonel Robert E. Lee arrived and surrounded the structure in which Brown was held up. First Lieutenant Jeb Stewart moved in under a white flag and offered the raiders their lives if they surrendered. When Brown refused, the Marines moved in and broke the barricades down, arresting Brown and his raiders. The treason trial for the Raiders, that's treason against the state of Virginia, 
began October 27th and ended five days later with a guilty verdict. Though sentenced to death on November 2nd, 1859, the state had to wait the mandatory month before carrying out the sentence. On the morning of December 2nd, John Brown handed his jailer a note saying, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. I had, as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed it might be done. He was hanged at 11.15. Brown's raid on Harpers Ferry was a potent sign of how fractured the United States was becoming. In response to the attack, the South began raising militias, fearing a thousand John Browns might be coming. Following the victory of Abraham Lincoln in the next year's presidential race, the nation came apart. In February of 1861, Virginia opened a secession convention discussing whether or not they should join the other southern states in secession. On April 4th, a vote on the matter yielded no. Less than two weeks later, on April 17th, a new vote yielded secession. From what I can see, both Jefferson County delegates to the convention voted no on April 4th and conditionally for secession on April 17th. The next day, with Confederate militias closing in on Harper's Ferry, the outnumbered Federal troops acted fast, setting fire to the armory and arsenal, destroying 15,000 weapons. The citizens of Harper's Ferry extinguished the flames, saving some of the equipment. On April 28th, Colonel Thomas Jackson took command of the Confederate forces in Harper's Ferry and shipped the weapons manufacturing equipment south. To the west, in Wheeling, Virginia, on June 11, 1861, a convention was convened. This convention declared that the Secession Convention had been called improperly, and as such, the act of secession was void, and all those who had voted for secession no longer held their offices. The delegates to this convention viewed themselves as the legitimate government of the state and voted for Francis H. Pierpont as the governor and chose two new senators and representatives. Washington immediately recognized this restored government of Virginia as the legitimate one. On June 14th, the Confederate forces abandoned Harper's Ferry, burning what was left of the Federal arsenal and blowing up the b Railroad Bridge as they evacuated. On July 21st, 1861, the Union returned to reclaim the city. Despite the loss of the arsenal, it still sat on the incredibly important b Railroad that carried men and material from the west to the east of the Appalachians. On August 17th, the Federal troops retreated to the safer Maryland side of the Potomac. On August 20th, back in Wheeling, the delegates of the Wheeling Convention organized a popular vote in the western counties of Virginia concerning the creation of a new state. On October 16th, 500 Confederate and 600 Union soldiers faced off in the Battle of Bolivar Heights, a Union victory that was followed by a retaliatory Confederate raid on Harbors Ferry that ended with the burning of a flour mill. On October 24th, 1861, the vote for West Virginia statehood passed. Jefferson County was not one of the original counties, but provisions were set aside to allow them to vote on the matter in the future. On February 7th, 1862, Union forces burned a commercial area of Harpers Ferry in retaliation for the death of a Union scout killed by Confederate snipers. Later that month, on the 25th, they reoccupied the town, with a garrison eventually growing to 14,000 men. In May, Colonel Thomas Jackson, now going by Stonewall Jackson, was moving up through the Shenandoah Valley, conducting a guerrilla war against the Union forces to great effect. On May 29th and 30th, Jackson's forces assaulted Harpers Ferry from Bolivar Heights before withdrawing with the town remaining in Union hands. On September 9th, 1862, the now Confederate General Robert E. Lee dispatched three columns of his forces to capture or destroy the Union garrison at Harpers Ferry. Stonewall Jackson arrived September 13th and captured strategic points on the hills surrounding the town. The forces on these hills began to hammer Harpers Ferry with artillery. The next day, surrounded with Union reinforcements delayed, 1,500 cavalry broke out from Harpers Ferry and escaped through Confederate lines. The town continued to be hammered by artillery. With no relief in sight nor any proper means by which to resist the assault, the remaining 12,500 Federal troops surrendered to Jackson on September 15, 1862. This was the largest surrender by the Union in the war. The Confederate victory was short-lived though, as two days later, General Lee was intercepted by General McClellan at the Battle of Antietam. Unable to advance further into Maryland, Lee retreated back to Virginia, with the Confederate forces at Harpers Ferry withdrawing on September 18th. The Federal troops arrived two days later, reoccupying the town and constructing fortifications on the heights. On October 1st, President Lincoln arrived to review the troops on Bolivar Heights and Maryland Heights. On February 4th, 1863, the restored government of Virginia authorized an election to be held in Jefferson County to join the new state of West Virginia, a vote that ultimately succeeded under the protective watch of Union soldiers. Union forces would continue to occupy Harbors Ferry until June 17th when they were evacuated to Maryland Heights across the Potomac. The reason for this sudden departure? Lee's Army of Northern Virginia had invaded Maryland again and were pushing north. Three days later, June 20th, 1863, West Virginia was welcomed into the Union, the 35th state to be admitted. 
On June 23rd, Union General Daniel Tyler, stationed on Maryland Heights, saw Confederate forces moving north, elements of the forces that would soon be arriving in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. One week later, Federal troops withdrew from Harpers Ferry to Frederick, Maryland, but they wouldn't be gone for long, returning to occupy Harpers Ferry itself July 14th in the aftermath of Lee's defeat at Gettysburg. In January of 1864, Confederate forces suffered a defeat just across the Shenandoah from Harpers Ferry when Colonel John S. Mosby's partisan rangers failed to ambush Union Major Henry Cole's Maryland Cavalry on Loudoun Heights. Two months later, the 19th U.S. Colored Troops marched through Harpers Ferry, recruiting new members as they passed. On July 4, 1864, Confederate General Jubal Early began to march on Washington, D.C., with a plan to move through Harper's Ferry on the way. Union forces retreated to the easier-to-defend Maryland Heights across the Potomac and held the Confederates at bay for three days until they retreated, marching through Frederick, Virginia instead. By the 12th, General Early was defeated and had returned to the Shenandoah Valley. On August 6th, Union General Philip Sheridan arrived in Harper's Ferry and set out on an expedition to destroy General Early's army and capture the Shenandoah Valley. Supply trains for Sheridan's army regularly moved through Harper's Ferry. On September 23rd, 1,500 prisoners from Sheridan's victories passed through on their way to prison camps in the north. On October 19th, 1864, Confederate resistance in the Shenandoah Valley ended with the Battle of Cedar Creek. That pretty much covers the Civil War history of Harper's Ferry as the Confederate forces were rolling towards defeat rapidly by that point. On April 9th, 1865, General Lee surrendered to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, and the war effectively came to an end. Harpers Ferry was devastated by the war. Practically the entire town had been leveled by fires or artillery. The arsenal, the largest employer before the war, was never rebuilt. Following John Brown's raid in 1859, Harpers Ferry became something of a destination for blacks, the spot where the end of slavery began. The old arsenal engine house, John Brown's fort during the raid, was one of the few buildings that survived the war. With the end of the war in 1865, there were over 30,000 freed slaves in the Shenandoah Valley that needed an education. To that end, a school for freedmen was founded in Harpers Ferry, despite opposition from some of the local white population. The school started as a one-room elementary with a class of 19 former slave children. John Storr, a philanthropist from Maine, donated $10,000 to the school, matching a gift from his fellow Free Will Baptist congregation. The government also donated the arsenal property to the school, bringing with it the land and four sound but battle-scarred structures. From the original one-room schoolhouse, Storr eventually evolved into a four-year college. The end of September 1870 brought with it another great flood to Harpers Ferry. The water rose so rapidly that there were many trapped on Virginia's island. The water carried away homes, mills, and took the lives of 42 residents. This was but the first of four floods to hit the town through the end of the 19th century, the others arriving in 1877, 1889, and 1896. In 1879, the B&O Railroad constructed an amusement park and resort on Burn Island in the Potomac. For five cents, a visitor was granted access to the site that included amusements, games, and playing fields. In 1891, Harpers Ferry lost the apostrophe in its name. This happened because despite being named for Robert Harpers Ferry, the United States Board on Geographic Names, established the year prior, was working to establish uniform naming conventions across the United States, and they removed apostrophes from most place names. That same year, John Brown's fort, which had been purchased by the B&O Railroad, was sold, disassembled, and reconstructed at the Chicago World's Fair. After receiving a grand total of 11 visitors in 10 days, it was dismantled and left on a vacant lot. In 1894, Washington, D.C. journalist Kate Field found the fort and worked to return it to Harper's Ferry. A resident named Alexander Murphy made five acres of his land available and the B&O Railroad shipped it for free. The next year, the fort was reassembled on his farm a few miles outside of town overlooking the Shenandoah River. The newly reassembled fort was visited in July 1896 by members of the National League of Colored Women who visited to pay homage to John Brown and his raiders. Despite the initial improvements in civil rights for blacks, the country began to backslide. The election compromise of 1876 ended Reconstruction early, removing federal troops from southern states and allowing the rise of racist laws and organizations. In 1896, racial segregation was upheld as legal by the United States Supreme Court with Plessy v. Ferguson. In the face of this worsening crisis, W.E.B. Du Bois gathered men from around the country in Niagara Falls, New York in 1905. Being denied accommodation in New York, they crossed the border to Canada where they held their first meeting. The Niagara Movement wrote a declaration of principles that included a call for blacks to be granted manhood suffrage, equal treatment for all American citizens, and it demanded equal economic opportunities.
They returned across the border, and the next year they held their meeting at Storer College from August 15th through 19th, 1906. It was a week of speeches, meetings, and addresses that concluded with a veneration of John Brown on the old grounds of the arsenal. Speaking to the crowd, W.E.B. Du Bois stated, We will not be satisfied to take one jot or tittle less than our full manhood rights. We claim for ourselves every single right that belongs to a free-born American, political, civil, and social. And until we get these rights, we will never cease to protest and assail the ears of America. The battle we wage is not for ourselves alone, but for all true Americans. The Niagara Movement, which now consisted of men and women following the week of recruiting, would eventually be rolled into the NAACP in 1911. In 1909, John Brown's fort was moved again, this time to the campus of Storer College. On May 3, 1924, another flood hit Harpers Ferry, washing out the highway bridge and permanently closing the CNO Canal. I mentioned that in 1850 they stopped construction, and this is true, but the existing parts continue to operate until this flood in 1924. The site is now a long, thin national park. 1936 brought with it another massive flood that washed away the bridges over the Potomac and Shenandoah and damaged much of Lower Town. This served as fuel to create a Harpers Ferry National Park to preserve the town for posterity. While this bill was stalled in Congress, another flood hit in 1942, wiping out the last vestiges of the b and Amusement Park. In 1944, FDR signed into law the creation of the Harpers Ferry National Park, providing work on it wasn't started until the war was over. Technically, it was the National Monument and it became the National Park, but anyway. In 1954, the Supreme Court case Brown v. Board of Education ended legal recognition of racial segregation. While this was definitely a good thing on the whole, it was the beginning of the end for Storer College. With all the colleges now open to blacks, the West Virginia State Legislature voted to end its funding of Storer College and focus on the larger, more centrally located schools. After educating 7,000 students over 88 years, Storer closed its doors in 1955. Storer College faced many obstacles in its time. Racial hostility in the forms of slurs, vandalism, violence, clan marches, and cross burnings. To financial difficulties, as they didn't charge tuition and relied entirely on donations. With the removal of the state funds, they couldn't continue to operate and were forced to close. Harpers Ferry National Park began to take shape in the early 1950s, with the obtaining of the land in the lower town. The Park Service restored most of the pre-1859 structures that were still standing, and they built a visitor center and the John Brown Museum. In 1968, John Brown's fort was moved again, this time to its current location in Lower Town. There have been tensions between the locals and the Park Service, as the Lower Town is effectively all a national park, and recreational opportunities such as swimming in the Shenandoah have been made illegal. Some locals don't like that they have to pay to visit their own town, but on the plus side, there is a Lower Town which it seems like it might not exist today if it hadn't been taken over by the Park Service. Along with this, the National Park Service maintains a part of Storer College. In 1972, Harpers Ferry flooded again thanks to Hurricane Agnes, but luckily the town seems to have been spared severe damage. Another flood in 1985 left several inches of mud in Lower Town. And in 1996, there were two floods that hit Harpers Ferry, the first time in its history that floodwaters have crested 29 feet twice in one year. Today, Harvest Ferry is a tourist town important in the worlds of industrial history, military history, and the history of the civil rights movement. Along with the restored lower town, Harpers Ferry bears other relics of its past in flooded industrial canals, pylons of destroyed bridges, and the remains of St. John's Episcopal Church. As of 2020, Harpers Ferry had a population of 285, lower than it's been in over 150 years, but it's a fairly stable population level. As with the other locations I've researched, Harpers Ferry is now on the list of places I need to visit. The natural beauty and historic nature of the town are powerful draws that will bring me there someday when I get the opportunity. With the real world history covered, I've got a couple more things to say about this content. First, regarding the pumping of water from Harpers Ferry to the White Spring, it would make very little sense in the real world. The real world counterpart to the White Spring, known as the Greenbrier Resort, lies approximately 175 miles from Harpers Ferry while the Greenbrier River is less than four miles from the Greenbrier Resort. Second, it's possible that the fall of Harbors Ferry came before the Enclave Coup of June 2086. We have very few dates on these events, and we have to extrapolate from the dates that we do have. There is only a single record of the responders acknowledging the fall of Harbors Ferry, and there is strangely a lack of any record of the acknowledgement of the fall of Harbors Ferry from the Brotherhood of Steel. The fall coming after the mass release of the Scorch Beast makes the most sense to me, but we do know that there were Scorch Beasts flying the skies before that. 
The main aspect that leads me to question the fall of Harpers Ferry coming at the same time as the Enclave coup is the existence of the Enclave satellite dishes in Harpers Ferry. We know from the White Spring Bunker that these dishes had to be placed by agents. Modus couldn't do it himself. While it's possible that the Enclave didn't place these until after the fall of Harpers Ferry, I think it's also possible that they placed it prior to the fall. We know they had agents in town before the fall, and that the Enclave was very interested in monitoring the Free States. It's easily possible that they could have installed these dishes at that time. Third, I've seen it suggested that Harbors Ferry was hit by the Scorched Plague prior to the main attack. This seems mainly based on Senator Blackwell's comments when his daughter passed away of, quote, Chatter on the radio coming from Harpers Ferry gets grimmer every day. Others out there are dying of the same thing, unquote. I don't think that his daughter or the people of Harpers Ferry at that time were dying of the Scorch Plague. I think that it's more likely the case that this was some other biological weapon. The Enclave at the White Spring had access to a top-of-the-line bioweapons lab. Senator Blackwell said that he remembered this illness from before the war. While the senator's dementia means that he's not the best source on this material, I believe that what killed Judith and the people of Harpers Ferry at this time was a refined version of a pre-war bioweapon. Potentially, this could have even been the new plague, but that's just supposition on my part, based partially on some non-canon content. I think that if this was the Scorched Plague, there would have been some record of the conversions into the Scorched recorded. Alright, I think that's enough on Harpers Ferry. If you want to receive notifications when I launch these lore videos, you can follow me on Twitter at GamingWithMaps. If you appreciate what I do here and you want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron on Patreon. I want to thank my patrons, Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Jill AWS, and Brian for their support. This has been the Irresolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.